Well, growing up in West Texas, uh, the public high schools there often had special speakers come in. And uh, back in the 80s in West Texas, it was still okay to talk about different values like integrity and honor. And there was one speaker by the name of Roy Benavidez, and he came in with his military uniform on, and he talked about honor. And he talked about what it meant to live a life of honor. And, and I remember thinking, what, what does that word honor mean? It's a word that we hear. It's a word that we use. But what does it mean to honor someone or something? What does it mean to live an honorable life? And we talked about the fact that honor means to, to exalt someone or something, to revere it, to respect it enough that you pay attention to it, you applaud it, you encourage it, to honor someone or to honor something. Roy talked about growing up in a town in West Texas, too. Poor, small town. His mom died of tuberculosis when he was only two years old. Dad passed when he was five. He was orphaned. He and his brother were taken in by an aunt and uncle. They lived with them and their five cousins. It was a poor family. In seventh grade, Roy dropped out of school altogether and became a migrant worker. And they traveled from Texas to California to Washington State, he and cousins and others. Following the seasons, picking the crops, that's how they survived. When war broke out in Korea, Roy Roy volunteered for the army. He joined up, spent a couple of years in Korea, and it was after that he decided to make a career out of being a military man, and that's how in 1965 he found himself being sent to Vietnam. Roy had worked hard, he'd trained, he was a phenomenal soldier, he was special ops. Special Tactics, Green Beret. In Vietnam, he found himself on a secret mission behind enemy lines. They were discovered, they were surrounded, they were attacked. Grenade went off. Roy found himself being evac home, sent to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, where he was told he would never walk again. The discharge papers were being drawn up for the medical discharge. He lay in bed for several days, seeing the news reports of people burning flags on college campuses and protesting a war that he had been a part of. And some riots and protests against a nation that he loved and honored. And he decided there's no way he's going to stay in bed. There's no way he's going to not walk again. And so against doctor's orders, late at night, he would drop himself out of his bed, crawl on his elbows and his chin until he could get up to the nearest wall and, and try to push himself up on the wall. After weeks of excruciating pain of doing this, Others in the ward found out about it, and and they'd stay up at night, and they'd wait to see him drop out of bed and crawl to the wall, and they began cheering him on. And and he gave them all a reason for hope. Month after month, in excruciating pain, Roy drug himself to the wall until he learned to wiggle his toes, and then wiggle his feet, and then move his knees. And after 12 months in the hospital, not only did Roy learn to stand, but he walked out of that hospital with his wife by his side. Two additional years of rehab and hard work, and Roy got to the point where he was sent back to Vietnam, which is exactly what he wanted. This time he would be at a base unit, he would be running communications for special ops, and that's where he found himself one day in 1968 when he heard the call that one of their teams of 12 men in Cambodia, which is not where they were supposed to legally be, but they knew that the Ho Chi Minh Trail was running Vietnamese supplies and they were gathering intelligence on it. What they did not know is that there was a secret base there. The 12 men were discovered. An enemy North Vietnamese troops started coming after them by the hundreds. A radio call came in. Helicopters were sent to extract them. A three-helicopter team found that the ground fire was so heavy from the enemy All the helicopters were damaged, crew members were wounded, and they had to return without evacuating any of their team on the ground. As soon as the helicopters came back, they were assessing damage. Roy spearheaded another mission to go and extract those men who were pinned down now by enemy gunfire. He hopped on the helicopter himself and said, don't tell me not to go. The helicopter hovered over the scene and saw there were their 12 men. Some of them already looked like they had passed. A thousand North Vietnamese troops were encroaching on their position. There was nowhere for the helicopter to land. As the pilot began to turn and say, there's nothing we can do, Roy leapt out of the helicopter several feet, landed on the ground, and ran the hundred yards to where the men were pinned down. He was shot in the face. 
and in the head and in the back of his leg as he ran through the gunfire. He assessed the situation. He called in for support, called in for airstrikes, and began to run things from the ground. And for the next six hours, Roy and that team fought off the enemy waiting for extraction. A book was written about it called Six Hours in Hell. Another helicopter attempted to make an extraction. One by one, Roy picked up the wounded soldiers and ran them the 100 yards to where the helicopter could land. Shot several times in the process. He loaded men onto the helicopter, gave it the signal to take off, and protected it with ground fire as it raised up. He was shot multiple times during that experience, but so too was the helicopter pilot, who was mortally wounded, and that helicopter crashed back to the ground. Roy drugged the wounded servicemen and now helicopter crew members off, reassembled them in a defensive position, ran back and forth to where the other platoon was, carrying soldiers to the shelter of this crashed helicopter and organized a team to hold off the enemy long enough for another helicopter to be brought in. As that helicopter came in and landed, Roy ran back to the original position, gathered all the intelligence from the bodies of the dead soldiers, took everything that needed to be gathered for their original mission, and then came back and one by one lifted wounded soldiers and crew members onto this rescue helicopter. He was attacked from behind, the soldier was so close, hit by the butt of a rifle. He turned to face the man who then ran him through with a bayonet. Roy pulled it out of himself, turned it on the enemy, and killed him. Others were attacking from a rear position where the gunner on the helicopter could not fire. Roy grabbed an AK-47 off another dead soldier, ran and took out an entire group of men approaching the helicopter. Only then did he allow himself to be drugged back on this extracting aircraft. As the aircraft headed back to the base, Roy went quiet. There was labored breathing at first and the no sounds at all. Men wept openly when they landed and medics declared Roy dead. He gave his life and saved eight other soldiers in the process. As they took care of everyone else and started to load them off, some of the men yelled, get a real doctor out here, get a real doctor out here to check on Roy. A field surgeon was brought from the nearby MASH unit. He inspected Roy and declared him dead. As they slowly zipped up the body bag, men weeping out loud, Somewhere from deep inside that seemingly lifeless body, Roy did the only thing he could. He spit in the face of the doctor to let him know he was still alive. They carried him to the hospital, worked on him for hours, evac'd him back to Fort Sam Houston, where it was determined that Roy had been shot 37 times, had shrapnel all up and down his body, had a bayonet wound that should have killed him, as the story began to circulate, Roy not only earned the Distinguished Cross, four Purple Hearts for his actions, but finally he received the greatest honor that a soldier can receive. When President Ronald Reagan presented him with the Congressional Medal of Honor, Reagan, the old actor, said this, if you had written this out as a movie script, no one would take the role because no one would ever believe it happened. It's just too incredible. Roy spent the next couple of decades of his life visiting high schools, visiting college campuses, talking about honor. I learned a lot from Roy's story. What does it mean to live an honorable life? What does it mean to honor someone? Here's a man who almost gave his life for others, very willingly gave up whatever he had to serve others, to save others. We would say that's worthy of honor. It's worthy of the greatest honor. We come today to the last of our 12 minor prophets. And we come to the book of Malachi. And the central theme of Malachi is going to be this. Honor God. Honor God. Well, how do you do that? How do you live a life that honors God? Well, you know, in order to understand Malachi, in order to approach the book, we need to kind of figure out where does he fit in all this history that we've been looking at, the hundreds of years of the minor prophets. Where does Malachi come in? Now, we were over at Alfano's house a while back, and Tony was kind of sad to admit that, no, it's not Malachi. He's not an Italian prophet. It's actually Malachi. It would have made a good story if he was an Italian prophet, right, Tony? 
So where does Malachi fit? Now, this is not a new slide. This is from one of our previous weeks. Here's a couple of these just to bring us back up to speed. We know now about the 586, the exile to Babylon. Babylon attacks. People are dragged off. All those various dates there. We see about partway down, 520 B.C., Haggai and Zechariah finish the temple. And we've been there for the last several weeks in these last couple of prophets. And then we find out about Ezra and Nehemiah. We've spoken about them briefly. They travel to Jerusalem from Babylon also. They're rebuilding the people, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And shortly after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, then we come to this last of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, the last words of God that will be spoken until John the Baptist comes in the wilderness. So 420 B.C. is about the time of Malachi, and he prophesies to Jerusalem. We don't have time to go into the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah much, but just to fill in kind of between Haggai, Zechariah, and what's going on, Ezra and Nehemiah are friends. They serve God together in Jerusalem during the 440s B.C., about 100 years after the initial return of the exiles. Ezra is primarily speaking to the people, to their hearts. He's building them up. He's encouraging them. Nehemiah is literally there to rebuild the walls of the temple. There's a great book by Chuck Swindoll about this called Hand Me Another Brick. It's a good book on leadership and character and honor. Ezra and Nehemiah is that time period. So then we come to Malachi. Or here's the big phrase we use, post-exilic prophets. These are just the prophets that came after the exile. Haggai, Zechariah we've seen, and now Malachi. Malachi, approximately 420 B.C., just after the time period of Ezra and Nehemiah, the last book of the Old Testament. Not just the last as we have them arranged in the Bible, but it's also the last one of the Old Testament chronology. This is, this is the end. This is where we leave the people of God, and there's 400 years of silence until we come to the time of John the Baptist introducing Jesus as Messiah. We don't get anything in the in-between time. Malachi's main theme is honoring God. What does it mean to honor God, to revere, to respect, to applaud, to exalt this one who is God? The whole book is going to talk about different ways that sadly the people then were not honoring God. And the prophet's going to say, but this is, this is why we should honor him. This is how we should honor him. And so we start into Malachi this morning, and we're just going to look at the first five verses of chapter 1. You'll see right off, it doesn't take him long to get to the theme. Malachi chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 as an introduction for us. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, declared the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, and I've hated Esau, and I've made his mountain a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. And though Edom says, we've been beaten down, but we'll return and build up the ruins, well, thus says the Lord of hosts, oh, they may build, but I will tear down again. And men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever." Your eyes will see this, and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. What's going on here? How does Malachi start this discussion of honoring God? Well, he begins this way. God loves you. Have you forgotten how much God loves you? And and look how the people respond in verse 2. Well, how has he loved us? We're going to find throughout the book of Malachi... As the prophet speaks of various challenges, the people say, well, how are we doing that? What what do you mean we're not honoring? What what do you mean we're not being faithful? How how is that happening? And God gives a very direct, very firm application and points out very specific ways that the people were not honoring God. And this first one is, they were living as though they forgot that God loved them. They forgot that God chose them. So we look in Malachi, and they say, well, how does God love us? And first of all, in chapter 2, or verse 2, he loves you because he chose you. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. And you say, well, how have you loved us? Well, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, your father, your ancestor. 
I chose you to be my people. Well, I could have chosen Esau's descendants, but I didn't. I chose you. You're the ones that I focused on. It doesn't take us long to read this before we go, okay, Jacob and Esau, got to kind of go back, remember the story there. Why did God choose Jacob and not Esau? Well, Genesis 25 tells the story. We'll just briefly look at it. Genesis 25, verses 21 through 23, this is what's written. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, Rachel, because she was barren. And the Lord answered, or excuse me, Rebekah. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. She has twins. And she said, if this is so, then why is it this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, there are two nations in your womb, two peoples who will be separated from your body. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. That wasn't the normal order of things. Even if there were twins, the one that came out first would be the older. That would be the one that would be blessed. That would be the one that would receive the greater inheritance. But God said, this is going to be the other way around. This is not going to be what's expected. Seems like a natural question, go, but... But why? What was that based on? What did God see in Esau or his future that that made him choose that? That's kind of a natural question that people have asked. The Bible actually gives an answer to that in the book of Romans. So if we turn to Romans chapter 9, this story will come up numerous times throughout Scripture. But particularly in Romans 9, we get the answer that we need to hear. Romans 9, 10 through 16. I want you to see this this morning. A series of reasons, what God has done for Israel, starting in verse 10. Not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything, good or bad, just so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand. Not because of the works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it's written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's what we read in Malachi. What should we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Romans clearly tells us God didn't look at what Jason was or what Esau was going to be and what his life was going to be like. He didn't look at Jacob and see what his life was going to be like or what he was going to do. Sorry, I looked right at Jason. I just saw that. Sorry, buddy. He didn't look ahead and say, well, you're going to make these kind of actually this, so I'm going to decide this. No, no, it says you're clear. It didn't have anything to do with those two boys. It didn't have anything to do with Jacob or Esau and how they're going to live. God just made the choice. Why? Because he's God. He chose to love Jacob. He chose Jacob. He chose to bless him. He chose to make him the people of promise and not Esau. Why? Because God will have mercy on whom he has mercy and he'll have compassion on whom he has compassion. And the author of Romans, the Apostle Paul, simply says, this is God's right. God is sovereign. He gets to choose whatever he wants to choose. We've seen throughout the prophets God is the Lord of hosts. He is the captain of the armies. He is the only one true God. He's the creator of all that is. He gets to do with his creation what he wants to. And his story here to the people in Malachi is, do you not realize I've chosen you and I've loved you? And the people say, well, how? How have you loved us? Because I chose you. And the people had gotten to the point where they kind of acted like they were entitled to this. That surely in some way they kind of deserved to be the people of God. They earned it. There were promises. There were things that they just kind of demanded. And God reminds them, hold on. I chose you. You didn't choose. I didn't do this based on your future actions. I chose simply because I chose. What does that do for us? Well, the passage we read from Ephesians 1. Turn there. We had it read out loud earlier. Ephesians 1, one of the greatest sentences in all the Bible because verses 3 through 14 are all one very long sentence in Greek. 
I am glad I never had this sentence on a final exam to have to show how it all went together. It's all one sentence that Paul writes. But it begins with, bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We might say, honor God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Why? Because, verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we would get to be the holy and blameless people. Why? Verse 5. He predestined us. Based on what? Based on the counsel of his own will. He chose us because he chose us. Because he wanted you. If you're sitting here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you place your faith and trust in him as your Savior and Lord, and, and you know that you are inhabited by the Holy Spirit, that you're a child of God, do you know why you're a child of God? Because he chose you. Now the scripture will talk about our human response, that we have to believe in him, we, we have to choose him, but behind it all, we find out from God's perspective, he chose you. How long has it been since you've thought about that? God looked at you before the foundation of the world and chose you to belong to him. John chapter 6, verse 44, makes it very clear that there was nothing you could have done. You didn't have any part in this. This is one of the hardest sayings of Jesus, that even his own disciples are like, whoa, wait a minute. What you mean it's not about what we do and how we live and how we act and how we follow the law and how everything. They had a hard time with this. Because Jesus says this in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verses 63 through 65. A little while later, Jesus continues this teaching. It's the Spirit who gives life. Your flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. There are some of you who don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that didn't believe, who it was that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I've said, no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. God has to choose you first. And this word in verse 44, it's like no one comes unless the Father draw him. Well, what does it mean to draw someone? Now, I don't mean take a piece of paper and sketch with a pencil. That's a different meaning of the word draw. But to draw something and to draw it in, what does that mean? It's interesting how the, the Greek word behind this, elkuo, is, is used a couple of times by John, several times in the New Testament. It's used throughout the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, verse 19. When Paul and Silas were in Philippi and they cast the demons out of this little slave girl and the master saw that their prophet was gone, it says, they dragged them down to the city authorities. And the image there is one of how you would do that in the ancient days. You would literally grab them by the hair and drag them kicking and screaming in their resistance down the street to the city to the public marketplace and press charges against them. It's the exact same word. Drawing even against their own will. Drawing even when they didn't want to go. Acts chapter 21 verse 30 when Paul is in the temple in Jerusalem and the Jews get so angry at his teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ. It says they grab him and they drag him out of the temple. They drag him outside the doors and then immediately they shut the doors of the temple. Well, that's going to have similar language in Malachi here about shutting the doors of the temple. But they drag him, kicking and screaming against his own will. And it's the word that John uses here to say, the Father has to draw you first. There is no one that just willingly says, well, I want to choose Christ because I just decided it of myself. No, God has to give you the choice. He chooses you first. He drags you into his kingdom. Ephesians 2.1. Why does God have to be the one that starts all of this? Well, Ephesians 2.1 makes it very clear. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. Not just mostly dead. Oh, look who knows so much. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. Everyone knows this, right? Miracle Max, sorry. Princess Bride pants. You were mostly dead. You know, Roy Benavides was mostly dead. They began to zip that body back. He hadn't died yet. You? You were all dead. 
You were dead, dead. Dead as a doornail, dead. I have no idea what a doornail is or why we use that phrase. But you were dead. Dead in your trespasses and sin. There was nothing you could do spiritually to give yourself new life. That's why Titus 3, 5, a verse that a lot of you learned when you were young. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. He says, what in the world is washing of regeneration? Regeneration, palagonesia, again, Genesis, is, is, is how it is. Genesia, Genesis. He had to have a new Genesis. What? He had to create life where there was none in you. That's what it means to regenerate you. It's a new Genesis. Which is why 2 Corinthians 5 can say, any of you sitting here right now who are in Christ, you're a new creation. You're a new Genesis. Why? Because you were dead. And God had to give you life. He had to regenerate you so that you could even make the choice to put your faith and trust in him. It starts with him. It's founded completely in him and the counsel of his own will. So, Christian, have you wondered, does God really love me? Yes. He chose you. But my life's so hard. Yeah, seven billion people on the planet, nearly eight billion. Life's hard for all of them at times. But you have been chosen by God. He chose you. Malachi starts off his prophecy this way and goes, Why should you honor God and live differently? Because he chose you. He chose to love you. We can understand that, can't we? There will be times where we go, does God really love Does God really care? Does God, we see it all throughout the scriptures, the Psalms. But one of the answers God often comes back to is, yes, he chose you. Remember that. It's where Malachi starts with the people. And not just did he choose you, but it's important that we consider the plight of those who do not know him. Those who are not chosen. Because very quickly, Malachi says, not only did God choose you, but remember, in choosing you, there were others he did not choose. By choosing your father Jacob, whose name would be changed to Israel, by choosing you, Israel, God did not choose Esau, whose name will be changed to Edom. Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, verse 2? Yet I love Jacob, verse 3. But I hated Esau. And I made his mountain a desolation. I appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. So Edom, descendants of Esau, oh, they'll say... We're beaten down, but we'll return. We'll build back up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the Lord with the sword in his hand. Well, they may build, but I'll tear down again. And men will call them wicked territory. And the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you'll say, the Lord be honored. The Lord be praised. The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Why? Because you were chosen. And we need to remember sometimes that God choosing us and God saving us rescues us from something else. So Malachi starts there with the people. Because God chose you, did not choose Esau. Remember Esau? Remember the Edomites? We looked many weeks ago at Obadiah, that little book, one of my favorites. Do you remember what happened in Obadiah and what the whole thing was about? 586 B.C., the Babylonian army is coming in. We see on the right, these are maps that we showed several weeks before. And as they start attacking Israel, as they start coming into Jerusalem, refugees by the thousand begin fleeing. And where's the only direction they can go? South. There's a sea to the west. There's a desert to the east. There's an army coming from the north. The only place they can try to escape is to go south. And as they go south, you see on the left, they have to go right through Edom, the descendants of Esau. You remember that city of Petra, that city of rocks back in the hill? As the prisoners or as the escapees are flooding through there, what does Esau or Edom do? They stood aloof. They gloated. They looted the city. They killed and enslaved the refugees, sold them as slaves to others. This was Obadiah. And do you remember how Obadiah ended? Because of all of this, 
Edom will not last. Edom will be destroyed. In fact, Obadiah verse 18, no survivor will remain from the house of Edom. And here later, God is saying through Malachi, oh, Edom has tried to rebuild, but I will destroy again and I will destroy utterly and I will destroy forever. And so now in 2022, the descendants of Jacob number in the millions. There are millions of people on this earth who trace their lineage back to Jacob. But there is no family group on earth that traces its descendants back to Edom. There is no people group on earth today that can trace themselves back to Edom. Why? Because the Edomites were completely wiped out. They were completely destroyed. Now, if you go on the internet and want to Google some websites, you'll find some crazy sites. Well, well, the Edomites, I mean, people with the same character, and they were the Nazis, and they were the Romans, and, this, and, that, and there's a lot of... But, but there's no actual people group. There's no ethnicity that traces itself back to Edom. Because Edom was wiped out. Edom was destroyed. And Malachi says, do you recognize that by choosing you, God saved you from the fate that others will suffer? And so you, Christian, sitting here today, do we remember what it means that God chose us? Romans 6, 23, you can probably quote it if you've been in church very long at all. You can probably say it with me. For the wages of sin is mostly dead or all dead? Dead. The wages, you know, what you earn, what you deserve for your sin is death. It's good for us to remember sometimes what we've been saved from because God chose us. That's the penalty. That's the punishment we deserve. That's what we worked for in our sin. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. There are still many in our world today, many preachers, even some from seeming evangelical churches who would say, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about hell. The Bible really does. Oh, that's just something that came from these kind of fundamentalist Baptists and others back in the day. Jesus never talked about hell. The Bible doesn't talk about an eternal hell. Mentioned, there's a great big church on the east side of Independence where the pastors become convinced that bad people don't go to hell. There's no hell for bad people. It's just everybody eventually ends up in glory and so don't have to worry. Because the Bible never even talks about hell. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. You will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you're suffering, Christian. After all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. To give relief to you who are afflicted, that's salvation, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. He saves his own but deals out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, to be marveled at among all who've believed, our testimony to you is to be believed. Do you understand that we are saved from this? We are saved from eternal destruction. Believer, it's good to remember that. It's good to remember, if he chose you, he chose to save you. He chose to save you eternally. And I know we know that. I know we know that it's factual. But it's good to be reminded what we're saved from. Revelation chapter 20 some have tried in vain to try to explain this away. There's just no way that you can. I'll read it. I'm sure it's familiar to you. Revelation 20, 10 through 15. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's good Baptist preaching right there. I don't know. We do that in the FCA much. But that's, 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 that's Southern Baptist right there. Fire and brimstone. But it was written here first. Well, that's where the devil goes. That's just, okay, where the beast and the false prophet are. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. And I saw before the throne the books were opened, another book, which is the book of life. 
The dead were judged from the things written in their books according to their deeds. In other words, those who were not in the book of life, those who were not chosen, those who did not accept Christ's offer of salvation. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them. And they were all judged, everyone according to their deeds. And Romans 6.23 reminds us what their deeds earned them. Then death and Hades were all thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Folks, the scriptures are very clear on the reality of hell. And I preached this this morning to those of you who are saved to remind us what we've been saved from. To remind us how incredible it is that God chose you. God chose to love you. He chose to save you. I know sometimes we're like the people in Malachi's day. It's like, but does God really love me? How do I know God really loves me? This is a day to remember what God saved you from. That he chose you and chose to redeem you. And we've seen the songs. Oh, my Redeemer lives. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. We ought to. We ought to love to proclaim it. We ought to love the fact that God chose us to save us. What, what do we do with this? How do we honor God in this way? Because Malachi is going to go on to say, you don't even honor your father in this. You don't honor your father in this way. You don't honor God. Well, how do we honor God by thinking of his choosing? There's some thoughts on that for you this morning. First of all, if you were here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you better be about it. Choose to accept his free gift of salvation. Yeah, even in our congregation here of this size, there may be one who maybe you've been in church a long time, but you've kind of thought, well, you know, I've grown up in the family. I've heard the stuff. I've done the thing. I kind of go. I mean, I'm a good person. I just, I, I mean, I, I think I love Jesus. But have you ever placed your faith and trust in him alone for your salvation? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it's real simple. This is what our gospel is founded on. Paul says, I'll give it to you just like it was given to me. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's it. That's the gospel message. You deserve to die, but Christ took your place. And Romans 10 said, if you believe in your heart that he's God, and that God raised him from the dead. If you believe that he died for you, and you say, I want that. I want to trust in, I trust that he really did come to die for me. He really was the son of God who really died in my place. And he was really dead, dead, not just fainted, not just kind of, he really died in my place. Well, I told the story at the beginning about, right, wasn't that an honorable life? Isn't that an amazing story? This man died for you, Jesus, in your place. And then after three days, dead and buried, he rose again to prove that he was the Son of God, that the price had been paid, that the wrath of God was satisfied, we say. If you've never had a moment in your life where you said, I do believe that. I do believe that's my only hope of salvation. I do believe that he died in my place. I do believe that he was buried and that he rose again. He is Lord and Savior and God, and, and, and I want to make him Lord of my life and follow him completely. Do that today. Make that decision. Honor God in that and accept this free gift of salvation. Those who've already done it, how do you honor your salvation? That's kind of a weird phrase, I know. Even when I wrote it, I'm like, honor your salvation. But Malachi is going to say, honor, honor God. How do you honor his choosing of you? Well, I think part of that is we constantly remind each other to live with an eternal perspective. Because listen, this life does get tough. We suffer loss, we suffer difficulty, we go through hard things. And it's good to remind each other, encourage each other. I know this is hard right now, but hey, th stop and think for a minute. There are billions of people on this planet who have no idea why they exist, who have no idea where they're going or what happens after death. They have no security in anything about purpose or meaning or value or significance. We, the people of God, we know where we're going. And we know that it's going to be for all eternity. And, and those aren't just words. That helps us get through tough days. Hasn't it helped you through difficult times? 
I've done some tough funerals this summer, a couple of them. They've been for believers in Christ who love the Lord. And guess what? They know where they're going. And we know where they are. And we know where we're going. And that helps us through some of the most painful, difficult times of life. So remind each other. Encourage each other. Hey, we've got to have this eternal perspective. We know where we're going. He chose us. So we work on making our life a grateful expression of honoring God. And that's one of those intentional things we have to come back to sometime. Today is a good day to come back to it. How do I intentionally make my life an expression of honoring God? Well, being grateful. Being grateful for what he's done for you. Colossians 3 would be a great passage for you to read this week. Mark that down somewhere. It's there in your bulletin. Can you, can you put that somewhere where you'll see it? Colossians chapter 3 is just an amazing chapter about the new self, the new life that God has given those of us who believe. Just a couple of verses from that, 12 through 15. So, those who've been chosen by God, oh, see, we're addressing the same people Malachi just chose. That's what we just talked about. Because you've been chosen by God, he chose you before the foundation of the world. Because of that, you are holy and beloved. You're set apart. You're different than the other billions of people on this planet. So put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Oh, people are hard to bear with sometimes, aren't they? It's been said about me. He can be a bear, okay? <laughs> bear with me. I'm sorry. Forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. Well, but you don't understand what they did to me. I understand what you did against God, and he forgave you. we got to come back to that at some point. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. Beyond all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And maybe it starts with that. My life, yeah, I have nothing to be thankful for. You can start with God chose me. When life is really, really hard, when things get truly difficult, you can start by being thankful that God chose you and then start working out from there. What does this choosing mean? What does that mean for others who don't know him? What, what has he done for me? What has he given to me by this? That's where Malachi starts. And then... Paul turned to this often. 2 Corinthians is just one of the times where he talked about it. Paul who was beaten, Paul who was shipwrecked, Paul who was stoned, Paul who was dragged into cities and out of cities, Paul who went through tremendous hardship, real persecution, says this, we do not lose heart. Oh, even when it's hard, we don't lose heart. How do you not lose heart, Paul? Paul. Even though the outer man is decaying, and decaying because they've beaten it, they've stoned it, they've stripped it down, they've whipped it with whips, it's decaying. But our inner man is being renewed day by day for these momentary light afflictions. Catch the man who's saying this. Beaten, abused, left for dead, dragged out of cities, presumed to be dead, has to pick himself up days later and drag himself down the road. These are momentary light afflictions. They produce for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. For we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. These aren't just words. It's not just a greeting card. Paul found hope in this at the most despairing times of his life. And you can too. And remember, he chose you. We're going to close with a song this morning called I Surrender All, written by Judson Van Deventer. It was written actually in 1896 when Van Deventer was at kind of a midlife crisis point. He was a somewhat successful artist. Or that's what he enjoyed pursuing. But he had sensed that God was calling him to some kind of ministry. And Van Deventer struggled over this for quite a while. Do I continue in his 40s? Do I continue as an artist? I give myself over to ministry. And at the, the deepest time of that struggle despair, he wrote these words, I surrender all. 
I surrender all. All to thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. Van der Winter went on to have a phenomenal ministry in the United States, England, Scotland, touring as an evangelist, and also as a songwriter. Wrote a number of other hymns, a number of other songs. During the 20s and 30s of 1900s, and he was older, he could no longer travel and serve. In his 70s, he went to be professor of hymnology at a little Florida Bible Institute. And while there, he encouraged students getting ready to go out to the mission field, getting ready to be pastors, evangelists, and say, surrender your all to Christ. Choose him above everything else because he chose you. In his 80s, in the late 1930s, he was still there at the Institute, encouraging, worshiping alongside students, and a young teenager attending the school was struggling. Do I go into ministry or not? Do I, do I sell out to Christ or not? This young 19-year-old man came into contact with the then very aged Judson Van der Venter. Van der Venter took him under his wing and said, I've never regret surrendering all to Christ, and neither will you. He chose you for this. Surrender your all to him. And over the months of that school year, Van de Venter poured into this young man, stood beside him in chapels. And, and this young teenager will write later in his memoirs, he's like, that man taught me about worship and honoring God. And those were precious days singing alongside this octogenarian who taught me what it was to surrender my all to Christ. And so when that young man went on to be an evangelist, he used this song at the close of many of his crusades, no other than the young Billy Graham, who learned from an aged man who'd given his all to surrender his life to Christ. Why? Because God chose him first. And Billy Graham would say the words of this song are ones that we need to sing. And so this morning as the worship team comes, you can open your hymnal. I think it's 366. And sing this song this morning, maybe like you never have before, about a life that honors God and choose to surrender to him. Let's sing.